So it is <clears throat> April 2nd. This is Senate Government Operations. And um, we are going to, we were scheduled to meet at one o'clock. I am right, right? Okay. So we're looking at the Montpelier Charter and then we have John <clears throat> Odom with us. And I think Dan Richardson is um, going to join us. I don't see him yet, but so um, I guess until we'll hear from him when he comes. Um, did you hear back from him, Gail? I guess I'm not sure. Maybe she doesn't hear me. <clears throat> but John, she huh? hears you. The button is supposed to give me an unmute and it didn't. So, oh, okay. yes, we did hear back from him when I sent the invitation. I haven't heard back from him today, but my understanding is that he will be joining us. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, Tucker, if you want to, um, we had a little bit on this before, but if you want to give us any um, details, remind us where we are, because it's been some time since we looked at this issue and then we'll go to John and Dan. Sure, the high level overview is that the Montpelier Charter would establish a system of city voting for non-citizen residents of the city. Um, this would permit for city issues and city candidates, non-citizens to vote on a ballot prepared by the city clerk according to procedures adopted by the city clerk. Um, and the city clerk would also be obligated to keep a separate checklist for these city voters. Um, one issue that I highlighted late in the discussion last time as I was walking you through it was that I noticed that inadvertently the authorizing section in A1 limited city voters to the non-citizen legal residents of the city. So uh, I prepared an amendment based on the request of the committee to add a clause that states expressly that you can vote in city elections if you are a United States citizen or a non-citizen legal resident of the city. That would, that would create a, an interesting conundrum, wouldn't it? <laughs> It, it would have created an interesting conundrum, and it was just one of those situations where the definition of legal resident of the city uh, was narrowly focused on ensuring that it was um, non-citizens who were uh, uh, permanent or indefinite residents of the United States and didn't go as far as making sure that United States citizens were also included. Good. <clears throat> Thank you. And you have that, you gave us that amendment, so. Yes, and it is posted on the committee's mm -hmm. uh, information page for today. Um, have you seen that, John? You're muted. Muted. Ah, oh, rookie mistake. I haven't looked at it yet. I just, uh, I, I understand that it's there. Yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so I just on. have one question, and this might be answered in there. <clears throat> Can can non-citizen residents currently <clears throat> run for an office or um, because you have to be a voter in order to run for the office? So this would, uh, um, by not stating it directly, but just um, allow them to also run for an office in, in a city position. Yes, the right to vote and the right to hold office under the Vermont Constitution and our statutes are unified. So by granting the right to vote in these city elections, uh, non-citizens would also be permitted to run for city offices. That's what I thought. So do we have any questions or anything right now for John or Tucker? Um, I, I, have a, I have a sort of a random one kind of, I was thinking about this last night, you know, what else do you do with shows you what kind of life we have you know that we think about these things at night but um so if somebody comes in to register to vote john to city city hall or wherever they're gonna have to say hi i want to register to vote and i'm a non-citizen i mean how are you going to know obviously it's just up to them to say so i mean have you thought about that at all i mean it's going to be 
the same system when when somebody indicates that they are a citizen on the form. They're giving us a, 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 a you know an oath on a form to which perjury attaches theoretically. Um, so it's basically the same, just the mirror as as any old form. Um, you know, you say. But they're not going to. Are they going to say on a form or something? That don't get me wrong. I'm not. I'm not trying to be a pain. I'm just trying to visualize how this would happen. So the form doesn't say I'm a non-citizen, right? Well, it says I'm uh, a citizen. It right. says I'm a citizen. So we would either, and I, I think the the language is is uh, gives a lot of deference to me. I would either use the same form, and just if they leave that blank, reassure, you know, with them that uh, that that was left blank intentionally, or I might just create a whole new form based on it. That, oh, that's right, I forgot, yeah. Okay. Leave that off. Um, probably I would just use the same form, honestly, and just verify with them that they intended to leave that blank, and then those go in a special place. Uh, Plus the form, the form now has a thing that says I am a citizen? Yeah. I haven't seen the form in a while. <laughs> I haven't registered to vote lately, so I don't remember. So yeah, a couple ways I might do that, but it doesn't okay, uh, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm sorry I was a bit late. Um, John, uh, would um, would it be possible for you to get from U.S. Uh, from whichever department it, in the United States government would give it to you a list of all the green card residents living in Montpelier, so you'd have a list, so you could just work from that. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure that might be very difficult to get, but, um, again, I, I would be concerned about creating new bars and new types of verification. We don't, for example, you know, compare when somebody comes in to, to register to vote, we don't match them against the grand list. We don't match them against any other kind of verifying list. So, um, I mean, I could, but again, I think one of the, one of the, underlying principles under this is we're not adding any additional burdens um, because that's a slippery slope. I mean, if you if you get that situation, then, you know, you could step back and say, well, for the non-citizens, we're making them go through this extra hurdle. So, you know, what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. Why aren't we making other voters go through the same hurdle? And so I, I think to avoid that kind of of, of argument, um, it's been very much, a, we're treating them just like other voters in the city. But uh, other voters are checked. I mean, other voters, you have to put your driver's license, that's checked. I mean, there are things that check with, when you register to vote. I mean, it's, you don't just accept Oh, that. oh I, I see what you're saying. Okay. Um, yes, if they obviously, they don't have a driver's license or a social security number. Technically, we are still allowed to allow people to vote. Um, but um, if they mail it in, they have to provide some proof of residence. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, under the current system, if they don't get me the proper ID, I still let them vote. That's, that's the rule from on high um because that oath it's all about the oath on that form but you know i would capture a driver's license if it's available um if it's uh, but when i register to vote when i register to vote these days i don't have to show proof of residency do i well, you no, only you write it down you you write down your driver's license number or the last four of your social security um i guess i should look at the form i right? should look at the voter registration form in a while but id is not required Right. Uh, ID is required in two places. You either have to have a driver, driver's license. You don't have to show it. You just write oh, it down. You don't have to show it. But, but that doesn't also, driver's license, writing down my driver's license number or my social security number doesn't tell them that I, that I live on Elm Street in Montpelier. No, no. It just says. It's true, but that's how you register. I th I'm sorry, I'm confusing going to vote versus registering to, to vote. <clears throat> when you register to vote, you fill out the form and it asks you for your address and it asks you for your town of residence, both your mailing address and your town of residence and your either the last four digits of your social security number or your driver's license. And then you take the oath and say that everything I've said here is true. 
And that's exactly what John is saying he would do for a non-resident. He would just leave off the, the, the line that says, are you a US citizen? Yeah. And they wouldn't check that, but they would do everything else that a, red, a voter who is registering to vote. Right. And does. I guess all I, what, I, what I was meaning was that you don't have to prove it in a sense. Like, you know, you write, you write it down. You, um, you're taking my word for it that I live on Elm Street in Montpelier. Right. Because <clears throat> right. you signed that oath. Right. That says, right. I've taken an oath that says it's true. And yeah. Well, and that's because this stuff goes way back. Right. Right. Um, and it hasn't been changed over the years simply because there hasn't been a reason to. Um, it's sort of an if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of idea. I always tell folks, you know, in, in terms of the access versus fraud balancing act, um, if you start seeing that balance start to shift, if we start finding evidence of fraud, and this would include at the city level, then obviously we would need to return to the conversation about restrictions. But um, you know, just making that oath on that form and we verify to the extent possible um, is um, hasn't been a problem so far. Which is not to say it can't be a problem someday, but at this point, it's not uh, hasn't been an issue. So what I'd like to do is um, switch to Dan Richardson, to, who um, when you you came in last year or last biennium and spoke to us and gave us some history um, about the um, when we started requiring citizenship to vote and, and just gave us some history and some background information on this topic. And I um, would like you to, to do the same thing for us today, if you would. We're, um, I don't know if you know all the committee members. Um, I, I'm Jeanette White from Wyndham. I'm Anthony, Washington County. Brian Collimore, Rutland County. Allison Clarkson, Windsor County. Keisha Rom, Chittenden County. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Good, sure, thank I'll be, you. I, I'd be more than happy to to, to walk through. Um, and I did, you know, I think one of the, uh, the good parts of this process last time around was um, you know, Tucker's predecessor, Betsy Ann Rask, did a really excellent job of outlining a lot of the constitutional issues um, that are involved here. And we had a very good dialogue back and forth. This was mainly in the House. Um, but I'll be happy to walk you through some of the historic precedent. The thing to keep in mind is that when Vermont was initially formed, the idea of citizenship wasn't necessarily codified as a concept quite the same way as we would perceive it today. Um, and the original Vermont Constitution um, did not have the citizenship element to it. It did add to that, I believe in 1828, the citizenship requirement. Um, and it is in the Constitution under uh, Section 42 um, that it requires citizenship uh, as an element of voting. Um, but the distinction that was in place even at that time, as far as we can consider, as far as we can see from the case law, is that voting and the freeman status was a state level voting qualification and that the subdivisions of the state, the municipal corporations were always seen as different. And that really, um, one of the cases where that really is illustrated is in, uh, let me just call it up, it's in, uh, State versus Marsh, which is from 1789. Um, and it discusses the Vermont Constitution um, and whether an election at the town level um, had the same requirements um, as a state election, because of course, town meetings at that point in time were primarily conducted by voice vote. Uh, and so there was a challenge to whether it needed, uh, whether the election of a select board member could be done by voice vote or whether it could be done by written ballot as the constitution seemed to require for elections. Uh, and Chief Justice Chipman for the, uh, for the court wrote that it was not, um, and he wrote that the framers of the constitution were forming a plan for the general government of the state. They do not appear to have had an eye to the internal regulation of lesser corporations, which are municipalities. In this section, they point out the mode of electing officers to the general government. And in this view, 
They confine it to elections by the people and general assembly. The people here mean the collective body of the people who have a right to vote in such elections and is used synonymous to freemen. The word election, when the choice is to be by the people or freemen, is in every part of the constitution used in the same appropriate sense, as in the seventh section, in order that the freemen of the state may enjoy the benefit of elections, as equally may be for each town within the state may hold elections therein. For what purpose? For the choice of choosing representatives in the 10th section, et cetera. I'm therefore clearly of the opinion that the 31st section of the constitution does not extend to the choice of town officers and is to be laid wholly out of the case under your consideration. So what the court is saying in that respect is that uh, the legislature can set the terms for local elections. And in that case, it was a voice vote um, but it also deals with the idea of citizenship. And we have an 1863 case after the Vermont Constitution had required expressly that citizenship be a component of, um, uh, of voting qualifications. So there's no question that the Vermont Constitution required uh, for qualification that, that US citizenship be a component of it. Yet in 1863, we have the uh, Woodcock case in which um, uh, the, an Irish uh, national who was living and owning property here in Vermont uh, was elected, I believe, the delinquent town, the, the delinquent tax collector um, for uh, for the town. And he was a resident alien, um, and he was challenged by uh, whether whether he could hold office. Uh, and in that time, uh, the court upheld his right to vote and hold office um, because the requirements for uh, this, and I believe at that time it was a school district, but it was, um, was that the person be 21 years of age, reside in the town and own property. Uh, and because he met those qualifications, he was eligible to vote and hold office. Uh, so as of 1863, you know, we have fairly good historic records um, from the court cases that one, um, non-citizens were allowed to vote in these local elections and hold office, um, and that did, did not offend the same constitutional structures that are, are in place now currently that require electors on the state level to be voted into office. That changed subsequent, and really in the latter 19th century and early 20th century, you had a shift away from uh, these requirements of voting that were really more property-based as opposed to uh, residents or citizen, uh, citizenship-based. And, and we moved away from that. So for example, you know, we don't require people to own property to vote in, in elections or, or pay a poll tax, um, but we do require them to be citizens, but that's really by statute. And that's a statutory change on the local level. And what we've evolved in Vermont is a system where by, by statute, um, any local election carry the same voter qualifications as, as a statewide or uh, state level office or, or federal election qualifications. And that's, you know, age of 18 or older, US citizenship, Vermont residency, and taking the, the free Freeman's oath um, as a requirement. Um, and so historically that's, you know, I, I want to be clear that that's not um, that's not anything that was necessarily the, the historical trend. It's something that did develop. It's been around for a long time. So certainly, in any of our lifetimes, this these have been the rules. Um, and you know, it did represent a shift away from other requirements for how we determine voter eligibility, um, such as owning property. Um, and the, right now it's, it's a single test. And so what this proposition with this charter change does do is it does create a different classification of voter. Um, it would be the non-citizen voter. Um, so what Betsy Ann, um, and I don't wanna speak for her because obviously she's not here, but um, what both Peter Teachout, myself, and, and I believe uh, Ms. Rask, Attorney Rask came to as a conclusion was um, you know, that it was not a violation of the Vermont Constitution to allow local uh, non-citizen voting. Uh, and that's also consistent too with 
uh, the difference that courts have long recognized between uh, state level and local level. And I'll just use by analogy, um, taxpayer standing. So if I'm upset with the federal government or the state government in the way they're spending some program, uh, say I'm not happy with a, a weather balloon program that the uh, Atmospheric Institute is, is running. And I don't like that my tax money is going to that. I can't sue the federal government for that. I couldn't sue the state government for that simply because my tax money is going to that. But if I'm a local resident of a municipality and I don't like, uh, you know, I feel that something, uh, some local tax money or, or government program is being run um, against either a constitutional principle. So for example, um, I've been involved in litigation where a town was sued for giving money to do the historic preservation of a church and uh, opponents sought to challenge that as a violation of the First Amendment and the separation of church and state. Um, they had standing to bring that case because of local taxpayer standing. The, the court recognizes it's different on the local level. We're much more closely connected on the local level than we are on the state or federal level. So we, we have this long tradition of treating local government and municipalities as, as different. And, and so what the constitution mirrors in this particular case is that um, the legislature sets the rules and they define what a voter is for a local election. Um, and what they have done, um, you know, and we've done this shift where we've gone from a, uh, property-based, sort of a stakeholder-based type of voting status um, to one that's much more sort of unified as based on citizenship and residency. So I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, answer any questions. I've, I've laid this out in a couple of memos and I would certainly recommend to the committee if they really want to dig into this, there's some really excellent law review articles that I cite in my, in my memo. Um, now Congressional Representative Jamie Raskin actually wrote, uh, was, this was an area of his scholarship when he was a law professor and has a couple of really wonderful articles uh, on what this means historically um, and, and across the sort of colonies uh, that became states and how that idea of citizenship evolved over time. Thanks. Any sure. question, uh, Senator Polina? Yeah, just, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of what you were saying, Dan, you ended by saying that the legislature sets the rules for local elections. That's but right. then if you were to go on from there, would you say, you would then say that local communities can change those rules or can, in other words, well, it sounds the, like you're saying the it's up to the legislature to define who can vote when you say that. It, it is. It um, is. I mean, that's why we're, that's essentially why this is here. I, I don't think you could create something where um, a, a local community could could on its own do this. Where because we're Dylan's rule state. Oh, that's um, right. It goes back any authority to again, has, right. to, has to come yeah. from on high, and we are this right. is on high. Okay. Okay. I got it. <laughs> we are on high. Yes. <laughs> we're high on ourselves. And, and it does. If you look at under um, the charter the section 20, 69 it says and they are to be under the patronage or control of the state but the general assembly shall provide by general laws for organizations of all corporations hereafter to be created all general laws passed pursuant to this section may be altered from time to time or repealed so right. we in this case we're not doing a general law we're doing a specific charter change but we could even make change the general law if we wanted to, to say that in local elections, all non-citizen residents could vote. We could, we could do that. You, you, you could, and, and, that's, and that's really sort of, I think there's a really two excellent points in, embedded in that comment, uh, Senator White, which is, um, first of all, um, there's a const, there was a constitutional question of whether this could be done. And, and I, I feel that the scholarship that we've we've put together has shown that it this is outside of the constitutional mandate. So it's really uh, a policy decision by the legislature. Um, and 
So the ordinances can be changed. You couldn't change it for statewide elections, but no. you could change it for local. Um, and the other point here is, is really sort of a larger, and you, you deal with this uh, every day as this committee, um, you know, there is a theory that local governments are laboratories. You know, we use this on a federal level to talk about states as laboratories within the federal experiment, but it, it's really true on a local level. You have a wide array of charters for towns and cities and villages, uh, and they offer different different options. And, you know, one of the, I think, the proposals that's embedded in here is that Montpelier is a relatively small community um, to try this um, experiment out. And, and it, is, it is an experiment because we've, we haven't done this in Vermont. Other communities throughout the United States have done it. Uh, Maryland and uh, I believe Chicago um, have, have either done it or are in the process of it. Um, and so, you know, the way we have our government set up and the legislature controlling the local uh, municipalities is that does give the, you the opportunity to say, well, if we give one community the opportunity to try this and if it's successful, we can uh, adopt it more broadly. Um, and if it's unsuccessful, then we can quickly fix it. And it's, uh, it's like a contained uh, plague. <laughs> So the, the two um, objections, oh, first of all, does anybody have any questions for Dan before I? So the two um, objections that I've heard most expressed, and if you, you might wanna comment on them, are if non-citizens are allowed to vote, then what is the meaning of citizenship? And the second one is, if we allow non-citizen residents to vote, why would we not then allow non-residents to sure. also vote in local elections? Those are the two concerns that I've heard expressed the most about this. Sure. Um, well, I don't think allowing citizen non-citizens to vote at a local level. And, and, and to be clear, this is not a, a slippery slope. This isn't something where if, if this got really popular, we'd suddenly be able to, you know, people would suddenly be able to, to move it up to the state or federal level. There's constitutional controls that would require constitutional amendments. And, and we know how difficult it is to change the Vermont constitution, let alone the federal one. Um, so it really is a cap. This is a limited uh, place and, and citizenship you know, it's, a, it's an interesting question because it's an evolving concept. And I would suggest that citizenship on the national level, which is what we're really talking about here, um, that would continue to have the same meaning that it does today. Um, and local elections are different. We're talking about local communities and how they spend their money on paving streets. Um, you know, we don't, uh, I happen to be now on the city of Montpelier city council. I, I can tell you, we do not have a foreign policy um, we do not have, um, you know, most of our decisions are really about neighbor to neighbor. Um, I get calls from people saying there are some big potholes in front of my, my street. Those are the common calls that I get. And those are the, that's the business of, of local government. Um, and so I don't think it would really impact that. Um, you know, the question of citizenship is a really tricky one. And I'll, I'll use an example. My one of my law partners, um, his wife is a Japanese citizen um, and she has kept her Japanese citizenship um, in part because her family lives there. Um, and giving up that citizenship would would be significant. And, and particularly right now, she hasn't seen her family in uh, over two years uh, because of the pandemic. Um, and she's going this summer. Now, my partner can't go because right now in Japan, only citizens are allowed entry into the country. So if she had given up her Japanese citizenship, she'd be prevented from seeing her parents, uh, from taking her kids to see their grandparents and, and aunts and uncles and family members. And so there's a number of personal reasons why people don't convert citizenship uh, from one country to another that really don't have anything to do with how they live or vote or reside. Now, this is a, this is a woman who happens to live in Montpelier has lived here for more than 10 years. Um, she works here, she pays property taxes, she owns a house, 
she lives here, she sends her kids to the local schools. You know, she is a member of the community in all respects, shapes and forms that we consider uh, membership in the, in the local Montpelier community. And, and really residency in a local community is not as much of a function of citizenship, um, you know, because it is something where right now under statute, if you're a US citizen and you move to Montpelier, you can become a Montpelier voter the minute you step foot off of the bus or car and arrive in town uh, under the rules that you've declared your, your residency. Um, and so, you know, the idea, and given the way society works now, people move around. Um, you know, it's rare for somebody to live in one place or time for an extended period. And that may be driven by family, by jobs, by all kinds of different situations. And so we have a very uh, malleable and permeable sense of what means being a member of your local community. And um, so, you know, giving, I don't think it changes the concept of citizenship, uh, but it does give voice to members of the community and what on the local level, um, you know, and I think that's ultimately a very conservative argument for, um, for this proposition, which is that, you know, what we're talking about are, are participants and members of a community having a voice in that community um, and directing where they want their money spent or not spent. Um, so as to your second question, you know, it's certainly, as I said before, it's the legislature's prerogative um, how they choose to define vo voting on the local level. Uh, but I would suggest that um, it's a very different proposition when you talk about non, uh, non-residents who just happen to own property, because now you're making ownership a component of, of voting, which we've, we've moved away from. Um, and you also would have the, the result where somebody would have effectively two, two residences. Um, they'd have their primary residence and they'd have the, the, the local voting rights in the community where they happen to own property, which is, I think, a very different philosophical conception. And I, I've, I should say, I've actually litigated voting, uh, voting role cases um, in, in various communities. And we had a town where there were people that owned property um, and they lived, in, they lived in Connecticut. And it was pretty clear that's their, that was where they were employed, that's their primary residence, where they spent most of their time. But they registered to vote up in this this northeast kingdom town um, because they because it was it, in some ways it was a it was a wonderful thing because they it was such a small community that they're bringing their family up to vote made them a huge voting block and they were power brokers in this town um, and so you know we had to remove them from the voting rolls and it went to litigation um, because they did not establish their residency. Uh, up here. And, and while they own property, they really were, you know, there's a difference and a distinction between where somebody chooses to make their residence and defining voting rights on the local level based on residency, um, as opposed to just mere ownership. Um, and, and, the, and the fact of the matter was, if these people want to go on the voting rolls, they can in the future. And, and that was actually part of their argument is someday we do plan to make this our primary residence. Uh, which the court said, that's great, that's wonderful, but today it is not. And therefore, you're, you're not allowed on the voting rolls. And then they were removed. Um, and that was defined because they, while they owned, they weren't participants in the community in the same level as a, as a primary resident and, and one, one primary residency. But that was, that was helpful. I mean, I think the same thing, but I just wanted to hear you you say it. Sure. That was uh, John. I just wanted to echo that non-citizen voting is distinct from non-resident voting. I mean, they're 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 connected in as much as they're all about voting, but that means you know non-resident voting is just as related to the eighteen-year-old limit or the oath. I mean, yes, they're all under voting, but they are very, very distinct issues that I think it would make sense for the legislature to take up separately from each other, the same way you would take up any other separate things. And as far as the citizenship thing goes, I do think there's a sort of implicit statement that comes from uh, the Montpelier community that we do implicitly, informally, 
consider these folks who we want to bring into our voting process to be citizens of the community. And I don't think there's any contradiction there any more than, you know, I can be a citizen of the US without being a citizen of North Dakota. You know, those things aren't quite that linear. And again, we're talking informally here, but I think that's that's the concept that the that the Montpelierites want. Ellis, Senator Clarkson. Uh, Dan, isn't there a, a national, I mean, there is, I feel like there is a law that says you can only vote in one place. I mean, you're not allowed to vote. You, you need to vote where your primary residence is. Isn't that a national yeah. law? It, it is for yeah. um, either state or federal elections. Uh, but if you think about, there, there, that law doesn't extend to local communities. Um, and that's really about the qualification for voters, um, for, for voting, which is, you know, you can't vote twice in a national election. You couldn't say vote for president in Connecticut and then again in Vermont in the same election. That's against the law. Um, just as you couldn't vote for governor from Sharon and from Burlington. Um, you, you can't vote twice in that same, same election. But these are non; these are separate elections. So there's no there's no law saying you you can't vote in Montpelier in their local, you know, town uh, city election, and then go vote in Boston, Massachusetts, in their local town election because they're non uh, they're they're disconnected and, and unrelated uh, elections. So the primary resident issue is a tax issue. I mean, because we think of you can only vote where you're where your primary resident in your primary residency. So are you saying that's a tax overlay on voting policy? It is not. Um, residency, primary residency is um, is a bit more complicated than that. And the Supreme Court, the Vermont Supreme Court has been a bit reluctant to, to define it. It has two components. There's an objective component and there's a subjective component. The subjective component is basically the person, the voter saying, this is my primary residency. I have no others. Um, I, I live here. And it's something they can, as I said, that doesn't have, we used to have, historically, there used to be times you had to live in Vermont for so long before you could make that declaration, a year, six months. Um, that's been removed so that the minute you move to the state or to the community, you can declare yourself a resident on a subjective basis. The objective component basically talks about some indicia that backs that up. Like I can't stand, stand in North Dakota and say, I'm a Vermont resident, never having touched the state, um, but mentally I'm in Vermont all the time. Um, that won't work. You have to have objective standards. And, and within that, there are really two types of tests that we would, I, I, I think are evolving in, in the court system. One is how do you create that residency and the other is how you maintain it. And I think it's important to think about that in separate ways. So to create it, you, you would have to take affirmative steps. And, and oftentimes it's creating a, a, an address. You know, if you, are, um, if, you, if you are voting in Montpelier, you have to have an address for your voter registration. Now, if you're homeless and you're voting, you know, you're gonna have to show other indicia that, that you are um, not only intending to be this your primary residence, uh, but also, you know, what have you done? What steps have you taken? Um, and, and to go back, I think their conversation before I joined in, these are all done under the penalty of perjury. So, you know, they can be tested and challenged and people can be removed from voting rolls if the objective indicia are not satisfactory. And, you know, so things like tax, is this your primary residence for tax purposes? Th those are generally indicia that are used. Um, you know, once you form that residence, once you sign that lease, once you you move to the state um, effectively, th those all become elements, but there's not one, the Supreme Court hasn't said, this is the one test for residency on the objective standard. They've always said it's a, it's a very fact specific. Um, and when they've looked at it from the other side, uh, from people, whether when, when they leave a community um, that's led to a couple of interesting cases. And that's uh, actually a bit harder. It's harder to lose your primary residency than I would say it is to gain it. Um, in that you have people that leave the state 
for example, my my spouse is living in California uh, this year in a postgraduate program. Uh, she hasn't lost her Vermont residency because she still owns our house. She still um, pays her taxes here. She still, you know, she has an intent to return. Her absence is temporary. Um, it's a defined temporary absence. And even if, even if this graduate program was sort of endless, the fact that she continues to see Vermont as her primary residence means that she continues to be a Vermont residence for purposes of voting. Um, obviously, if you enroll and say, my primary residence is somewhere else, that's evidence that you no longer have that subjective intent to make that your primary residence. Um, and, and then if you've taken steps such as moving out of state, that, that couples with that. Uh, but that's a slightly different test. But, but they're all very fact specific um, indicia to, to determine. And, and, and in part, the way the statutes are set up is if somebody makes that uh, averment uh, under oath and is challenged, the BCA hears that challenge and does a fact specific uh, hearing in which persons can bring evidence forward why this person isn't a resident or bring evidence forward in support of that residency. Thanks, that's, sure. uh, that's interesting and helpful. Tucker, did you have, a, did you? Yeah, I just, it tickled my mind when you were all were talking about whether or not non-residents could vote I think that there are a few municipalities with specific municipal boards where non-residents can vote. And those are the municipal enterprises, water and sewer and electric utility districts uh, for some of them. And I just looked up the charter for Northfield. Uh, the commissioners of those boards are elected by rate payers, not by voters, but specifically by those that are paying the rates for the utility they're receiving. So theoretically, and I don't know if this is the practice in any of those communities, but uh, a non-resident who qualifies as a rate payer on that system could vote for those elected offices. But not for the select board. Correct. Because the, presumably there aren't rate payers for select board people. Right. I, I don't think too many select boards get um, pay from their constituents in the terms of rate. It would be nice, huh? No, but they do get paid. Well, they get paid, but they get paid out of the town budget, not out from ratepayers. Correct. Yes, I guess if you. That yeah, that that is interesting. Thanks, Tucker. That's. Any other questions or comments or concerns or. Um, no, the, it just passed on the House floor. I think yesterday, right? The Winooski Charter. So this is. You know, it's coming at us again. More towns may be interested in extending this, right? And and after we've done it once, it, we we could extend it to, as Dan said. I mean, we we have it in our authority to extend it to every locale by changing but, the general statutes. Yep. But but on the other hand, I, just, I want us not to forget the fact that we didn't bring this to the floor last year because we didn't have the votes to pass it. Right. In the Senate, so. It's not as it's not easy as it sounds. Right. And I'm wondering, I'm not I'm not saying you guys would know this necessarily, but I'm wondering what kind of arguments were made against it on the floor of the house. I don't know if you paid attention to the floor debate or not. No, but we can, the nice thing about our life now is you can go and watch it. Oh, thank you. I'd rather have somebody recap it for me if <laughs> if they wanted to. <laughs> I don't know if anybody from Montpelier watched the debate on the floor for either Montpelier or Winooski, and if you had any, um, what the concerns were, Dan? I'll, I'll only offer this, and um, I did not watch the floor debate, but I have, you know, in discussions, you know, I think the concept of citizenship is, is often the thorn, um, you know, and I'll, I'll be honest, I first dealt with this when I was um, representing, uh, when I was working with some city councilors in Burlington when this issue came up as a proposal. Uh, this had to have been eight, eight or more years ago. Um, and I was hostile to it at first because I think there's a certain presumption of, well, this is a function of citizenship. And we divide um, you know, the people that have a voice in government between the citizens and non-citizens. Um, and you know, it wasn't until I 
dove deeper into this concept and started to parse it apart. And, and what I came to is I, I'm, I'm a merit patch counselor for the scouts. Um, and when you're in scouts, when you're working through your Eagle badge, you have three citizenship badges you have to earn. Citizenship in the world, citizenship in the nation, and citizenship in the community. Um, and I think that's a really helpful framework, um, you know, because I think we mix the concept of citizenship in the nation with citizenship in the community, and they are different. That is a helpful way of looking at it. Uh, I have to tell you that when I first heard this, I felt the same way. I said, no way, Jose, no way. But I've learned, I've learned um, more by as Senator Sears said, by listening. Um, Senator Polina, you had a... Well, I was just going to say that the argument, <clears throat> excuse me, the argument we heard from people in our caucus last year was that voting was a privilege of citizenship and it's something that you don't give away lightly. You don't, don't if, if, if people want to vote, they should become citizens. It's a privilege to vote and it should only be retained by citizens. That's, that's the argument people are making in the caucus. So, can, Dan, can you remind me, I believe that when, when the U.S. Constitution started, required citizenship as a, it was around the same time that we started having a lot of Irish immigrants. And uh, am I right about that? When there yeah, was kind I, of a, a it, the first influx, move, the movement against immigrants? Right. It, it was part of you know, if you think about, I, I don't think the founders would have had the same concept of citizenship that we articulate now, right. um, because a lot of them weren't, they, you know, they weren't natural born citizens. They weren't, um, you know, they, they created the idea of this country. And so, you know, you only have that sort of first wave of immigrants and, and they were primarily from, from Ireland that you start to, people start to codify the difference between those who've been here and those who have just come. Um, and of course, you, you, you have a lot of the pushes to change the requirements for voting coming during different periods of time. You know, the, the Chinese immigration in the latter 19th century out West, um, the early 20th century, particularly around World War I with the fear about Germans um, and Japanese that were, were driving the sort of um, uh, pro-citizen pushes um, in, in the legislation. And, and these are, are in part re reflective of it. It's not the only reason. I think there's yeah. sensible reasons why we create citizenship and, and create these distinctions. And in part, that's what, that's what informs people the concern. And I would echo the caucus's sentiment. Voting, the franchise of voting is a serious thing. And you know, the, when you think of expanding it, you, you should do so thoughtfully. Um, and I think that's what certainly led me along this path to say, you know, to come from a skeptic to someone who believes that this is a, a good thing and a good policy, um, you know, because of the different um, standards that are employed here. Oh, John, sorry. Yeah, I just want to add into that and follow up with the, the comments Senator Polina said, although I do tend to bristle at the idea of voting as a privilege personally. I think it's a, a basic expectation um, rather than something granted from on high, which pri privilege implies. But let's start from the, that, you know, let's, let's you know, but assume that it is. I think it's absolutely right. Um, voting is a privilege uh, for citizens of the country. They have that privilege. Voting is a privilege for citizens of the state they have that privilege. What the community of Montpelier is saying is that they want to extend that privilege in that context to people they consider, we consider citizens of our community. So we're not speaking to the privilege of citizenry to the state or, this, or the US, we're talking about the privilege of citizenry to Montpelier. And so I think it's a completely consistent uh, approach. And may I, Madam, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Dan, was it 1828 of uh, the, the citizenship was, uh, became a requirement. Is that what I wrote down correctly was required to as an element of voting? Yes, uh, so, at least in the Vermont Constitution. 
Mm. U.S. citizenship was added to the Vermont Constitution as a voting requirement in 1828. And when was it added nationally? Bef just before that? I, I believe so, although I don't have that information in front of me. So I, I'm- It does parallel with the potato famine as I recall. I mean, with the huge first ex exodus out of Ireland. Right. No, it's, right. And, and I just to go to John's and, and, and the privilege, what's a right and what's a privilege? And it's an interesting balance here because one, it, it, that, that's a policy and philosophical difference, uh, I think, as we think of it, something as a right or a privilege. And how much prejudice and we, they, the human gut wiring, I mean, it's so bizarre that we're so wired for for the clan, for we, they. Uh, it's just always amazes me how much prejudice plays into our, our laws. Never ceases to amaze me. <laughs> Senator Clarkson, I'd suggest uh, going back to some of the research and memos that Betsy and Dan and others produced about the timeline of uh, voting in the United States in federal elections. And the reason that it's fairly complicated to track from at least the time that the Vermont Constitution incorporated citizenship as a requirement is that it went state by state until federal law was amended requiring citizenship. And uh, the perhaps the last state changed in the 70s or 80s. And then federal law was amended, I think, in the 90s. You should go back and look at the okay. timeline of events because it's, from what I recall, it's fairly recent. 1880, 80s and 90s. It's if it's 19. 1920s and it took 60, 70 years to complete. Uh, 20th century is what I was talking oh, oh, about. Oh, so, I uh, it took 100 years or more for this slow rollout to take place. Wow. Amazing. Oh. <gasps> And, Dang, sweetie. Ooh, and, and that's actually still reflected in, in federal law. I know one question that came up is if we allow this, will it cause problems with federal law? And, you know, so, so um, non-citizens who vote in local elections, would that impinge upon their ability to seek citizenship or would they be in violation of federal law? And 18 USC section 611 um, which is the relevant statute actually allows for this type of, of, of voting um, and says that it is not a violation of uh, federal law for a, a non-citizen to vote in a local election where the either state or the state legislature or the local ordinance allows for such. You know, have we, we lost our chair somewhere, didn't we? Yes, she, she just vanished. disappeared. Yeah, she just vanished off the Zoom. She went, well, got sucked back into history. Um, you want to just go see? Want to go see if she's out in the hallway? Yeah, I'm going to go check and see if she's gone to a probes to get us more money for something. Uh, may, Mr. Vice Chair, may I ask? Sure. I just want to say that also that's fine, Senator Clark. Since oh. asked your question, but we're going to wrap this up in just a minute or two because we have to move on to another topic at two o'clock. You are so good. Um, I guess my favor is to Gail and Tucker, if we could refresh all those documents and put them currently on the page, on our yeah. page, for people who are wanting to, uh, so that we can send people to those documents that are current, which uh, without them having to go back two years or a year. Yeah, it was 2019, we discussed this last, I think, right? We could refresh it and have everything on our web page now that would be great yeah i was going to make the same request actually i appreciate that great minds yeah and you're in the square next to me uh, in, on my computer i'm up here i know <laughs> well okay um well i'm sure we'll spend some more time talking about this another time but i think we should move on um thank you john and thank you dan for joining us and all your expertise and knowledge it's really really helpful 
Because I just would remind us that this was not an easy thing to do back in 2019 or whenever it was we brought no, it up. And it, it wasn't. To talk about privilege and citizenship, you should have been in the caucus meetings we had. You would have enjoyed being a fly on the wall there, believe me. And I, may I sp speak to John on a point of personal privilege? It is always a joy to live in this small state where I just spent the previous hour with your wife in a in the women's caucus and then to come into this it, it's just it's great you know it's like oh i've got the whole family now i just need the boys that's right well you can invite you know them to to, to testify to um, they're full of wisdom oh i'm sure <laughs> thank you guys for being here appreciate it all right thank you very much senator thank you always a pleasure thanks thanks